Hi there and welcome to this video. There's been a lot of talk about heat in the um, new camera space over the last couple of weeks, largely driven by Canon's R5 release. Now I did a, a video about a year ago looking at the end-to-end -end process with regards to 4K and should you look at 4K. And in that I highlighted that there, in the design of um, modern cameras, there is a triangle that you have to trade off between battery power, processing power, and heat. And the challenge that designers of modern cameras have is to balance that triangle. You've also got attention and pressure with regards to weight and size with the aspirations that modern mirrorless cameras have set. Now in my last couple of videos I looked at the new flagship cameras or headline grabbers that have come out and I looked at the route maps that different companies are taking. Um, we've obviously got Canon with, as I say, their R5 release, which is a 45 megapixel camera that headlines 8K video capability. Sony are taking a slightly different route. They've got a 12 megapixel camera rumored to be released this week, probably be released before this video goes up. And that's a video centric 4K camera. And in the last video, we looked at how Nikon might take their route map forward. So there are differing route maps and each of them is pushing different boundaries. So as I say, there's been quite a lot of talk about heat being an issue, particularly focused around the Canon R5. And Canon have taken some flack with some limits on the length of 8K video that you can take. And that's largely caused due to heat management. Now this is not a new phenomenon. As I've said in previous videos, I've got a um, Sony RX100 Mark V, and this is a brilliant camera in a very small lightweight package. I bought it for its video capabilities, and sadly, um, one of the capabilities that is quite limited and is really its Achilles heel is that in 4K, after about four to five minutes, it becomes heat limited and you have to stop, allow the camera to cool down before you can carry on um, recording. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's not linked just to Canon. Sony have had their challenges in the past, um, but it is one of those corner points in that triangle that I talked about of battery power, processing power, and heat. So I thought in this video, we would look at some of the innovations in this space around heat management. Um, and I thought rather than look at the functionality, we'd get into the sort of micro level innovations, get beneath the surface and look at what the innovations might help us move forward in this space. Now there's two ways we can approach the challenge of heat management. Firstly, we can create less heat. And secondly, we can dissipate it better. So let's look at each of those in turn. Firstly, let's look at how we can perhaps create less heat. It sounds pretty straightforward, but in a modern camera, whether it's mirrorless or DSLR, there's a lot of processing that's required for the autofocus, for processing the images, getting the exposure right. Probably the largest source of heat in the modern camera is from the CPU or CPUs if it's got multiple of them. There is some that comes from um, the use of the battery because obviously that's a chemical process as well, but the vast majority is from processing. And therefore we can look at this in a number of ways, but processor efficiency is really key. And this is where smartphone manufacturers like Apple have invested massive amounts um, they've really looked at how they can design efficient processors, both in terms of the design being custom built for what they require. So every transistor has a purpose. The, the amount of memory in the end to end is, is perfectly refined to what's required to give an efficient flow of data and information and processing through that processor. And layout is another key in this. So actually custom designing your processors for what you are trying to do is really important. And this is where we may see Nikon with their rumored Z6S and Z7S and the possibility of having dual CPUs in there come into their own where they design a main CPU, which is an XPED, perhaps seven um, processor for processing the images. And then we have a separate processor that's been designed specifically for perhaps autofocus. The second area where um, efficiency comes into it is the silicon technology. You know, increasingly we're seeing the likes of Intel and other manufacturers using 10 nanometer technology, which allows for smaller transistor gate sizes and therefore 
more densely packed silicon, more transistors per square millimeter on the um, CPU. Now this can make the processing faster because you can get more transistors on there, but it can cause heat density issues. And therefore it could go against reducing the amount of heat that's produced. So we've got to balance that. Now another area which I think is really exciting is new materials. Now silicon has been the go-to material for CPUs for many decades now and hasn't really had a competitor to it. However, with the rise of things like graphene, um, which is a down at the atomic level of a single atomic layer of carbon, which is really strong and really efficient, it may be that what we see coming forward is actually layering graphene with silicon to give strength or heat dissipation. We'll cover that again in the next section, but giving a different blend of materials that is far more efficient um, in processor power. So really interesting times coming up, and I think we might see some disruptive technologies moving forward. They'll probably manifest themselves in smartphones first or other devices, but they then will ripple through probably into the processes we see in modern cameras and may help with this heat issue. Now, the second option we've got in producing less heat is to actually either reduce or move the processing um, in the end-to-end um, life cycle of producing a video. And what we might see here is increasingly the use of raw video in camera. So we move the processing of the raw footage, as we've done in images, out into a more powerful computer-based environment. Equally, we might see moving some of the processing, i.e. the codec work, perhaps to an external device like a Ninja 5. And any of you that have got a Ninja 5 will, will know that it runs really hot um, and has a fan built in. So we've got an opportunity there to move the processing out of the camera into another device. Now this brings in the challenge that I talked about earlier around size, weight and cost. So we've got some really interesting trade-offs that we've got to balance in that end-to-end -end life cycle. So if that's about producing less heat by looking at how much we process, how efficient that processing is, the second option we've got is to dissipate the heat better. And the real challenge here is around the size and weight. You know, if you look at any of the videos of the breakdowns of a um, Nikon Z series camera, you'll know that inside that, you know, pretty compact body, it's a pretty tightly packed layout. So we've got a real challenge there and there's not a lot of space. Now, most modern cameras, certainly like the Z6 and 7 at the pro level, have a sizable alloy frame built into it, which is a great heat sink. So we haven't got a lot of opportunity around that. Equally, weatherproofing is really important and therefore we don't want any openings, additional openings, and therefore most likely improvements in heat management are going to have to be a relatively passive approach. You can't put a fan into a modern mirrorless camera without undermining that weatherproofing. So we haven't got a lot of room for manoeuvre in that space. Now, we might see new materials that are perhaps lighter or stronger alloys, which allow us to perhaps create a slightly larger heat sink in the frame of the camera. We may see graphene coming into play, as I said in the previous piece, um, perhaps as a layer in the CPU to transmit heat quicker away from that CPU, that source of heat out to the, out to the heat sink that is the um, frame of the camera. So we may see uh, you know, these atomic levels, the use of things like graphene to really dissipate heat quicker and more evenly out to the surface of the camera where it can be passively moved out into the atmosphere. Now equally we've got a challenge here because we, the coverings we like to put on the outside of our cameras are there to protect the camera but also to protect the users from any heat spots and therefore we don't want the cameras too hot to hold and equally we don't want the heat in front of the sensor because that will ruin the optics. So we've got a real balance here and a challenge um, between producing less heat 
and how we dissipate it. Now, I think the real opportunity where we're going to see larger movements is in the former of those in producing less heat, because then you've got less heat to dissipate. And the opportunities are probably greater in that area as well. What do you think? What are you seeing in the marketplace? Let us know in the comments below which you think you're going to see the most opportunities coming out of um, and where you think the balance will be. Now, it's important to put all of this in context. Whilst we've seen a lot of headlines around heat management over the last couple of weeks, largely driven by the Canon R5 um, release, it's probably not a major issue for most users because most users are probably not going to be recording more than 20 minutes of 8K video at this point in time. Over time it may become more of an issue but hopefully the technology will move forward and innovations will come forward that allow that time limit to be pushed out and possibly disappear as we've seen with 4K video. But it does demonstrate the challenges of designing modern cameras, whether they're mirrorless or DSLR. No longer are they purely optical devices, they're electronic devices with optics built in. And therefore the skills that are required by all of the manufacturers are evolving at pace. It is really a challenge for all manufacturers and therefore moving the skills that they have in their design teams to keep up with these challenges is really important to keep the innovation flowing forward. So I hope this has given you something to think about, irrespective of whether you use a Sony camera, a Canon camera, a Nikon camera, the challenges are the same for all of the manufacturers. And it's really important for innovation to keep pushing the boundaries on some of these so we get increasingly more capable, more powerful um, cameras to use over time. Um, be interesting to know what you think are the biggest challenges, how fast you think we will see the evolutions moving, how important it is to you. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, as always, you know, do hit the subscribe button, do hit the notification bell below and you'll be notified of future videos. And as always, it's been great to see you on this video and I look forward to seeing you on future videos.